Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this inaugural uh, Kazakh Singles event. We'd like to thank everyone for joining on um, this first event, which will be the first of many events. Um, we'd like to thank all the Shatkanim for, for coming out and for, for, for helping everyone uh, to, to find their match. Um, we'd like to thank the Shul, Bain El, for opening their doors. Um, following the lecture tonight, um, everyone's invited to go downstairs. It's going to be a, a hot buffet, and as well as Shalkhanim uh, there. Um, so please, if, uh, if you're interested in anyone, please use the Shalkhanim. Uh, they're there at the table over there. Um, and um, just a little background about what the Kazakh single is, is that it's not just good um, that, that to, to you, to, like today's event was 20 year, 20 year olds to 35 year olds. And we're going to uh, create different events and programs and initiatives um, for, to help the singles, so please uh, reach out to anyone involved with the event at the front table or any of the Shantanim to give your ideas or your involvement uh, to help um, this uh, program to come to its full fruition. Um, I'd like to thank Rebecca Joseph and Fumi Weinberger for all their involvement in tonight's event. Um, I'd like to thank the entire committee. Um, Simcha, and Noah, and Rahman, and uh, Sean Weinberger, the dating coach, and I uh, hope I'm not forgetting anyone and everyone else's involvement. And it's our great honor, Rabbi, Rabbi Ben Sion Klatsko has uh, been involved with the Jewish world for, 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 for many years, involved with many different programs. Um, Shabbat.com, he has his own Shaduchim. Um, he helps uh, sh uh, sh uh, make sh 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 Shaduchim every single week. And um, it's our great honor to call by Rabbi Ben Sion Klatsko. Hey, good evening, everyone. It is wonderful to be here. I know that you're not here for me. <clears throat> I'm very aware of that, and I wouldn't be here for me either. But add a little bit of Torah, a little bit of spice, and then we get down to business, and I think that's why, uh, uh, that's why I'm here. Uh, I, I just actually heard um, a joke to start with. You know, Uman is in Ukraine. I don't know what they're going to do this year because uh, it's, it's closed for business. But uh, someone once uh, told his wife, you know, I'm going to Uman, this Rosh Hashanah. She says, okay, great, Davin for a shidduch. Because, you got it, okay. Um, because davening for a shidduch is sort of a big deal. We daven, we hope that we're going to find that person we're going to spend the rest of our lives with. However, we expect in a, uh, an event like this that the rabbi is going to be speaking a lot about Shaduchim. The truth is, I'd rather be speaking about the, the month of Adar because we're in the middle of the most joyous month of the year. It's a very, very unique month. And I'm going to start with just a little bit of a question. It says that in the month of Adar, we have good mazel. Mazel. We have a good mazel. We have good, it's not really luck. But it's, 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 you know, they say the mazel is the zodiac sign, what we're born under. But there is a concept of bad mazel and good mazel. That's why we say mazel tov. Here's the problem. The problem is that it says in the Gemara in Shabbos, Ein mazal Yisrael. We are not dependent on mazal. We don't have luck. We've got God. If that's the case, what does it mean that this month there's a good mazel? There's no mazel because we don't depend on mazel. The answer is we don't depend on mazel for bad, but if there's something good, we could have a little bit of extra frosting on top. Hashem, we could have Hashem, and Hashem will add the good mazel, and together with our tefillah to Hashem plus the good mazel, good things will happen. So I give you each a bracha. This should be a month of goodness. Okay, and, and, um, and it could happen in the blink of an eye. That's like that. My son, I have a son also in Shaduchim, 22 years old, and he likes to say, by the way, just in case you forget, Hashem is actually in this room looking at you. Hashem is at this singles event. He's right here. Not somewhere. He's right here in the room. Look around. Hashem is right here. And we have to understand and appreciate Hashem is here and Hashem wants us to be very successful. So the first thing before I even begin is I want to make a plug for something. I have a great friend named Jonathan Donath who started a program called Daily Giving. And I'll tell you, how many of you have heard of Daily Giving? You want to raise your hand? Less than half. 
Um, I, I, just, I want to share with you the idea because I think for Shidduchim, it's a very powerful concept. The idea is like this. There are tzedakahs out there that we know are doing great work. Let me give you an example. Hatzalah. Did anyone here ever have to call Hatzalah? I did, more than once. To call Hatzalah. It's an emergency, a danger. Hatzalah comes. I know when I give stuck at that sala, it's, it's going to a good cause. So what daily giving did was they said, if someone gives a dollar a day, they're going to give the 40 most impactful tzedakahs, and every day one dollar is going to go to a different tzedakah. So basically you're diversifying your portfolio. So I give one day to Hatzala, one day to Tom Chay Shabbat, Tom Chay Shabbos. How many of you have heard of Tom Chay Shabbos? Good, we're involved in that as well. That's in Staka, where you're able to make sure that poor people have money for Shabbos. People have anxiety, depression. I just think it's just a wonderful thing. And I want to just tell you how to do it, and I'll tell you why. I want to tell you, you can go to dailygiving.org. This is not my program. I, I got Shabbat.com, I'll tell you about that. This is someone else's program that I believe in. And I think it's going to be good for Shaduchim. It's called dailygiving.org if you want. You can take out your phone. It's a dollar a day. No skin off the back. I think it's a huge, huge thing. I'll remind you at the end as well. But this is why I want to tell you this. I just heard that there was a young lady who heard about giving a, to a different tzedakah every day through daily giving. And she went over and she, she signed up to give $2 a day. So the head of Daily Giving went over and said, why are you giving two a day? I mean, you could. You can give as many as much as you want. She said, I'm giving one for me and one for my future shidduch. I want to start giving for him already so that he should be involved in tzedakah. Less than six months later, she was engaged. So tzedakah is powerful. Tzedakah is powerful, and it's hard to give. You know, we work hard for our money. But I'm a big believer in Staka, and the more you give, the more you enjoy giving. So that's my plug for a different organization that I think is doing a great job. Once again, you can go on, there we go, you go online, give a dollar a day. It's an easy, easy mitzvah to do. Great. Having said that, I want to share with you now a concept in Shaduchim that uh, I think is incredibly important. When my phone gets a little bit of a, it gets a message, pops up, it says, there's an upgrade available. Makes me really happy, right? An upgrade available to my phone. I like when my phone is upgraded, especially if I'm not paying any extra for it. I just upgraded my phone, and then, you know, you just let it upgrade, you may have to plug it in, you may have to wait a few minutes, and then it goes dark, and then when it turns back on, you rub your hands together and say, wow, I wonder what new goodies. Maybe there's something in the chat that allows me to send a new kind of message. Maybe there's something that makes it more secure. But an upgrade is good. We agree with that. Upgrades are usually good. So I want to share with you this idea. Just like an upgrade on a phone is good, an upgrade in your life is good. You can upgrade your life. You have the ability to upgrade every part of your life. And it's not that your life is not good. I am sure your life is marvelous. I hope it's grand. But everything that you do can actually be upgraded. And when we upgrade our lives, Hashem has extra rachmanas on us. Hashem gives us extra siyata dishmaya, extra help from above when we upgrade. Now we know the Torah stands on three pillars. The, um, the world stands on three pillars. We know this. It's the second Mishnah in Perkei Avot. Who wrote this Mishnah? Or who has mentioned this Mishnah? There's a man by the name of Shimon HaTzadik. Who is Shimon HaTzadik? Shimon HaTzadik was actually a Kohen Gadol. He was a high priest. And he was somebody who was so unique and so special that he actually stopped Alexander the Great from going into Jerusalem and conquering it. You know the story? There you go, Alexander the Great. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, out walks Shimon HaTzadik, 
wearing all eight garments of the high priest. And Alexander the Great, he's a very, very famous person in history. He falls off of his horse and he bows down to Shemunat Tzaddik. And all his army looks and they said, what are you doing? You're Alexander the Great, you're bowing down to a Jew. And he says, you don't understand. Every time I go into battle, the night before, I have a dream, I have a vision, and this man, who I never met, comes to me, and he tells me whether I will be victorious or not, whether I will win or whether I will lose, and I know what to do based on this man. I never met him, and all of a sudden, I met him. And Shimon Atzad says, please, don't conquer Jerusalem. It's not good. I don't want you to. And Alexander the Great says, okay, I'm not going to, but I need to show that I have power. So let me put at least a statue of myself in your holy temple. Now, do we allow statues of people in the Beit HaMikdash? Never, ever. So Shimon HaTzadik says, why do you want a statue? It's a, it's, a dead, it's a dead thing. I'll tell you what. Instead of a statue, let's make a deal. No statues, but every boy who is born this year, we're going to call him Alexander. And that, my friends, is how Alex became a Jewish name. Anyone here know any Alexes? That's how it became a Jewish name. It wasn't a Jewish name. But instead of putting an idol in the temple, Alexander the Great said, I won't destroy Jerusalem, I won't conquer. And every boy that year was called Alex. And if you know an Alex, they are named after somebody who's named after somebody who's named after somebody who's named after Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, I'm sorry, Shimon Tzadik, who, who Alexander the Great saw, said the world stands on three things. Torah, Avodah, and Gemilut Chasadim. Each of these three things can be upgraded. And when you upgrade these three points, two things happen. Number one, you get closer to Hashem. Number two, you have extra siyata deshmaya, extra help from above, to find your shidduch. And we're going to explain to you how this works. Let's begin with Torah. I have meetings. I do matchmaking. I have matches going on right as we speak. When we make matches in the Jewish world, we do something different than in the non-Jewish world. I happen to be a college rabbi as well. I've been a rabbi in a college for over 20 years. And I see my students who are either secular or I see the non-Jewish world out there, the non-Jewish students. And the way that they find somebody is they go to a bar, they go to a party, someone looks cute, someone looks handsome, someone looks popular, and you go over and you speak, and, and soon, oh wow, there's this thing, and right away, there is this animal attraction to the person. But you know what there may not be? There may not be any reason to invest in this person. They may be a person of low moral character. They may be a person that doesn't have good values, but they're cute. Maybe they drive a fancy car. Did you ever hear the, the word, I, I learned this word recently, gold digger. I just, I just learned about this. Did you ever hear that? Is it a common thing? It is a common thing. So I'm learning about my kids saying, there's such a person who they go and they look at your car and they decide to date you based on whether you've got the, the new Tesla plan. Could you imagine? Now, okay, that is a good reason. No, I'm kidding. That's a good car though, right? But that's not how Jewish people look at the world. The first thing we do is we say, can this person run a Torah home? Are they invested in a Torah lifestyle? They can be cute. They can be sweet. They can be funny. They can be charismatic. And they can be an empty shell of an empty person. As a matter of fact, you know and I know that sometimes the cutest people out there never have to work for it. And they never have to craft their inner moral values because they got, they got by on their looks or they got by on their charisma. But what about substance? 
Hashem says, before I made the world, I made Torah. I use Torah to make the world. The Torah is the blueprint for the world. Well, if you're going to build a world and use Torah, how much more so building a home? How much more so building love? So the first thing you want to do is to make sure that the person that you are interested in dating has their roots firmly grounded in Torah. Let's go to the Purim story for a moment. Hashem declared, decreed, that the Jewish people should be destroyed. Destroyed? Really? Why? The answer was because the Jewish people had abandoned Torah. They had abandoned the Chachamim. They had left it. They did whatever they wanted. And maybe the basics they did. But the deep stuff, the exciting stuff, the Torah stuff, the spiritual, let's go to the party. Okay, we'll try to eat kosher if we could. I don't know about the vessels. They may not be kosher. I don't know about the entertainment. That's for sure not kosher. But I'll go. You know what happens? Without Torah, relationships dissipate. I'm right now working on a few relationships that I'm not happy about. And I'm not happy about it because all there is is animal attraction. And they say, Rabbi, what do you think? And I say, you really want to know? Does this person learn Torah? Do they have a rabbi? Do they ask their questions? Are they involved? No. But they make a good living. You know what? So do 7 billion non-Jews. If that's what it takes to be husband or wife materials, you make a good living, or you have high cheekbones, nebuch. We've got to be different. We're aman nivchar. Hashem said, when the Jewish people returned to Torah, I saved them from Haman. When the Jew I'm going to tell you something. I don't even know if I should say this, but you know, we're among friends, right? So I met the chief rabbi of Russia two weeks ago. We had a nice, we had a nice lunch together. It was right before the invasion. And he was telling me, again, I don't know, whatever. Hi, everyone. I, I'm, I'm a Torah anytime. He's going to watch. It's going to come out bad. But he, say, he was telling me before the invasion, he says, you know what? Putin actually likes Jews. Actually, I knew that. But he said, on his way to, me, to visit me, Putin actually called him. It's very bizarre. Putin called him on the way to me. Oh, Putin again. My kids say, Dad, it's not Putin, it's Putin. Said, Either way, he invaded, he invaded Ukraine, right? Putin, he says, Putin once called him in and said, I got a question for you. He said, how did the Jews survive so long? Every other nation collapses. Every other nation disappears. But the Jews, they're still around. How do you guys do it? And this rabbi his name is Rabbi Bira Lazar. Do you want to know? Rabbi Lazar says, said to me, he said, I knew that whatever I answer is going to be a bad answer. Because if I say, well, Jews are extra special, that's how we survive, you know what he's going to say back? Well, what about the Russians? Either way, I'm going to step my foot in my mouth. So you know what I said to him? I said to Mr. Putin, that's a really good question. What do you say? <laughs> Smart answer. So, he, so Putin said back, he said, yeah, I did think about it. You know how the Jews survived? Three ways. Three reasons the Jews have survived. They have Torah, they have family, and they have rabbis. That was, that was, that was Putin's, that, that's what he came to. Even a guy, a murderer, right? Even him understands that Jews survive because of Torah. So look right now in the mirror. Look at yourselves and ask yourselves the following question. I like upgrades. What can I upgrade in my Torah learning? What can I do? How can I take good, make it better? How can I take better and make it best? Well, one way is through Torah Anytime. I think Torah Anytime is recording this. It is one of the biggest brachas that we happen to live in the day and age when I can turn on a computer, open an app, see a daily dose, look at my WhatsApp, I can, I can see a shiur. Oh my goodness, how did that happen? Torah everywhere.
If you watch one shiur a week, watch two. If you go to one shiur a week, go to two. If you don't learn Bechevruta, find the Bechevruta. There are many ways. Now I'm going to tell you something very special. When I was a rabbi in UCLA, there was a guy who was looking for a girl, Jewish guy, not that religious, but learning and growing. And one day, he slapped on a yarmulke. And he comes over to me afterwards and he says, Rabbi, it's magic. I don't know how it happens. It's magic. When I walk on campus with a kippah, the girls are coming over to me. They want to schmooze with me. They want to get to know me. Without my kippah, no one, no one even noticed me. You guys know it's true, right? So I said, it's very simple. You know what a kippah does? You know what a yarmulke does? You are showing, listen carefully, you are showing that you're a person who has values. And I want to tell you something, men. One of the things that women look for is somebody who has values, who is stable, who represents something. Women want to look up to you. They want to look and say, wow, this man of mine, he's somebody that could be that avabais, this father figure in the house. So when you walk around UCLA with the yarmulke on, you know what you're saying? I have values. I represent Hashem. I represent Torah. And guess what? That's attractive. You became more attractive. So I want to tell you, for Torah, when you are able to tell a young lady, you know what? Yes, I like you. We're going out. We're funny. We like the same music. We like the same restaurants. And... I have a rabbi, and I learn Torah every week, or even every day. Guess what? That upgrade made you more attractive. There was a young lady who used to come to me for Shabbat. And she was, uh, this is when I lived in LA, and she was a very uh, professional lady in her field. She was learning about Judaism. But she was a dancer. She danced for the Los Angeles Lakers. She was a cheerleader. She was like very hot stuff. And there was a guy who came to me for Shabbat. And he was a person from more of a religious background. and Very nice guy. And he says to me, who's that, uh, who's that young lady over there? I said to him, she's a nice girl, but she's out of your league. I'm telling you, I know you, I know her. She's like very, she's out of your league. You're not, you're not getting this girl. Like, a lot of the guys want her, but he got her. He ended up marrying her. You know how he did it? He went over to her, and he said, would you like to study with me the Parsha of the week? And she said, sure. And he bought her an art scroll chumash, and he got one, and each week, they would bond over the Parsha. And guess what? That worked. Because when Torah is your anchor, you have values, you have substance, and that's attractive. So that's number one, Torah. Upgrade it and watch the magic happen. Number two, Avodah. What is Avodah? Avodah sounds like work. We know today, Avodah means tefillah. I cannot tell you, listen carefully, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit shocking. I cannot tell you how many shiduchim I tried to make. And the girl asked, does he go to Minyan? And when I said, no, or not really, or once a day, or when he can, the girl said, I'm not interested. I can't tell you how many young ladies said, no, I'm not interested. The, the man's job is to go to tefillah. You go and you daven, and you make the shul yours, avodah. And it's hard work, let's be honest. I'm in the middle of a game or in the middle of whatever, and I don't, I'm not in the mood. And I get it. I'm a guy. I'm not always in the mood of davening. I know. I get it. But somebody who has those principles, something amazing happens. When you show Hashem, I want to, again that word, upgrade my tefillah, Hashem says, you know what? I'm going to upgrade the way I listen to your tefillah. Wow. So from now on, when you want something, I'm going to listen more, says Hashem. Like it says in Perkei Avot, do Hashem's will like it's your will, 
and Hashem will do your will like it's His will. Tefillah works. Davening works. I want to tell you, there are people in this world who are experts at tefillah. I have a son who is named after somebody named the Klosenberger Rebbe. He was a big, big Rebbe. It's a very sad story. He lost 11 children in the Holocaust. And the Klosenberger Rebbe, he rebuilt. He built an institution in the name of every one of his children. And when he davened, his tefillah was so powerful. His davening was so sincere. He put so much effort into it that when he finished, it looks like he had just played football. He was sweating profusely his tefillah. But you know what? When he davened for someone or something, it happened. So all over the world, people sent tefillah to the close of the Rebbe. The Amshna of Rebbe in Israel is the same way. But you're the same way also. What do you need to do to upgrade your tefillah? I'm going to tell you. All you need to do, whether you're a man or a woman, all you need to do is have kavana for one minute. Just one minute of kavana in your old tefillah, you're already better than 95% of the people out there. Even if the rest of the time you're going ba 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 ba, one minute, one minute at any point, give it one minute. If you're doing Bekat Amazon, one minute. Bekat Amazon, 30 seconds. When you leave the bathroom, you say, Asha Yatsar, take a few moments. You upgrade your tefillah, Hashem says, I'm going to listen. Purim, the simcha that we had on Purim, started off with tefillah. There was fasting, and people davened for three days, and they said, save us from annihilation. And Hashem said, you're davening, I have to listen. We all know that tefillah helps. The problem is, when we don't believe it in our heart, we don't daven like we're supposed to, and then it doesn't work. But then we say, oh, it doesn't work. That's because we don't believe it. To believe it and upgrade our tefillah, one minute a day, that's number two. Upgrade our learning Torah, upgrade our tefillah, and the last thing is, upgrade our gemilut chasadim. That's number three. The great Shimon Tzadik said, you think you're kind, but you could be kinder. We all want to believe we're as generous as we can be, but we know, maybe in our heart of hearts, that we could do more. And today, more than ever, we have that ability. Gemilut chasadim makes us heroic. I'm going to tell you something fascinating. Tell me, if I were to ask, and I've done this, a non-Jewish person, who is your hero from the 1500s? They will look at me like I'm crazy. Who's your hero from the 1500s? Well, who's your, well, then maybe from the 1400s. I imagine in those 100 years you've got a hero. Who's your hero from the 1800s? Uh, I don't know, Abe, Abe Lincoln? Who's your hero? Don't you have heroes? The world does not have heroes. The world's heroes today are movie stars and athletes. And maybe throw in Elon Musk because he's doing cool stuff. Right? Maybe in the past 20 years I'll be able to find a hero. But give me a hero? Oh, Gandhi. Yeah, really? You think about Gandhi a lot? Really? That's like in the top of your mind? The world does not have heroes. And it doesn't have heroes because their actions are meaningless. Who's a Jewish hero from the 1500s? I could tell you. Arizal. Bet Yosef. 1400s. Ritva. 1600s, late 600s, early 700s, Baal Shem Tov. 1800s, Chassam Sofer. 1100s, Rashi. 1112, Rambam. 12, Ramban. We know who our heroes are. The non-Jewish world does not have heroes. Think about that a moment. There are no heroes because they can't name one of them. You know why? 
Because our actions, our gemilut chasadim, together with our Torah, makes us historical people. And the non-Jewish world, they have, they have history. They have history. They have history books. They have to memorize for the test. But it's not their heroes. They have no heroes. We have many. We are replete with the greatest of the great. We know stories of Hillel and Shammai. We know stories of Avraham Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu and Yoshua Binun. We know about Mordechai and Esther so much they don't know anyone from there. We know because these people are the people that we model our lives after. They're the ones that we call our kids when we name our kids. We name our kids, kids born this month. What do you think their names are going to be? Many of them. Mordechai, Esther. Why? Because they are heroes. It's a fascinating study to think about this. Why is it that the world doesn't have heroes? I'll tell you why. In order to be heroes, to be a hero, you have to have tools. You have to have tools. Let me explain something to you. Putin cannot just turn around and leave Ukraine. Even though he cannot win at this point, he can't win. There's no way. Even if he conquers the whole Ukraine, you, you, you can't be the head of a country that doesn't want you there. There'll be guerrilla warfare, and eventually they'll be depleted. He is in a zero-win game at this point. He'll bomb. He'll, he'll destroy many things. He'll kill, kill many people. The whole world has made him a pariah. He has become ostracized by the world. His country went bankrupt overnight. Between today and tomorrow, they're actually going to be defaulting. It's going to be... Well, Visa and MasterCard just pulled out today from, from uh, Russia. That means you can't even use your credit card. It's collapsing. So you know what he should really do? He should really say, you know what? Imagine this a moment. I made a mistake. I made a I shouldn't have invaded. I'll pay you for the stuff. <laughs> I'll pay you for that big jet I, I destroyed and those nuclear... I'll, I'll, I made a mistake. I'll go back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for bothering. Would he, would he ever say that? No. Never. Why? Ego. Ego. He cannot control his ego. Because to control your ego, you need tools. You need to say, I don't know. You need to say, I made a mistake. You need to say, I'm sorry. A person should teach their tongue to say, I don't know. A person should say, are you Michael me? We go over, we say, I'm Michael, everyone, are you Michael me? I'm Michael you. You forgive me, I'm sorry. That takes humility. That's a tool. You know what gave us these tools? Torah did. But Putin... He is an egomaniac. And he wasn't the only one. I'll tell you something again. A little controversial. Can we be controversial tonight? Totally, right? Without ego, Trump would still be president. It was so simple. It was so simple. You know why? Trump was thrown out because of COVID. But all he had to say was, they said, you said you, it's not going to be so bad. All he had to say was, I thought it was going to be. I made a mistake. I didn't know about how bad the disease was. No one knew. Nobody really didn't know. If those words would have left his lips, they would have been valid. That's all he needed to say. Everyone knows. All he needed to say was, I didn't know. <laughs> I, I thought, yeah, mask, no mask. I tried to follow it, but I didn't. I didn't know. You didn't know either. No one knew. He couldn't say that. So he allowed everyone to say, ah, you see, you said it wouldn't be so bad. He said... I thought that this medicine's going to help. I also did. You also did. A lot of people were trying to find stuff. Tools. Tools of humility. That's what makes us great. Tools of generosity makes us great. All the tools that we try to give our children, all the tools that we look for in a shidduch, those tools where a person goes the extra mile to be sweet and humble and not be self-promoting and not be late to a date. And if they are, they let you know and they're considerate of your time. Accidents happen. 
but apologize. Don't just not apologize and go about it as if it's the same. These are great tools, but we need tools. Kimilut chasadim. We practice becoming givers. We break that mida inside of us that wants to keep everything for ourselves. Do you know no one gives more tzedakah than Jews? In America, the most donated to charities are Jewish charities. Because we train ourselves, we teach ourselves. When I was in shul, there were two very poor people that were there every day. And they, they came every day, and we never thought, oh, they should go to work. They were compromise, what can you do? And one of the people, one of the people, he was like a, a, a nudgy guy. He would, he would stand there and nudge, and if you didn't move, you, if you didn't give him money, he wouldn't move. And the other guy, he used to poke me. Hey, do you have, do you have? And I, I don't know about you, I don't like being poked. But yeah, I, felt, I never said anything to him. Hey, do you have, do you have? And in my mind, there was Nudgy Man and Pokey Man. That's in my mind. And one day they both came at the same time. I was trapped. I was trapped. I'm going to get poked on one side, nudged on the other side. Okay, but I want to, get, I want to do a mitzvah. So I took out my wallet. I gave to Pokey Man some staka. And before I had a chance to do anything, he took half the money and gave it to Nudgy Man. One poor guy giving another poor guy tzedakah. That's who we are. Even the poor people give charity. So, how do we upgrade our gemilas chasadim? The answer is pashut. It's simple. Look at what we do and do a little bit more. And I'm going to tell you a very easy thing you can do. It doesn't even cost any money. If you go through your WhatsApp, you will find that you have thousands of contacts, probably thousands, right? Is that fair? Thousands, if not many hundreds. There are some people that have not heard from you in a long time. Could you imagine if each day you would just go and with a little voice note, the easiest like little voice note, say, hi, do you want to tell you I was thinking of you? And I wanted to let you know I'm sending you love. Um, this is called, this is called real time. This is in real time. I'm gonna go like this. Here we go. I'm gonna go like that. I'm just gonna let it go, go, go. And then I'm gonna pick somebody. Okay, here we go. Hi, this is Rabbi Klatsko. I hope you're doing really, really well. I'm wondering how your Shabbat was, and I'm hoping you have a great, great week ahead. Cost me nothing. That was a real message. And probably in the next few minutes, that person's going to message back. So easy. And makes people feel good. And costs nothing. We live in the day and age where learning Torah is easy. Torah anytime. Davening. There are more Batek Nesiot than there ever were in America today. Agmilt Chasadim. Just take out your WhatsApp and make someone feel great. These are things that we do on Purim. We learn Torah, Kimu Vakiblu, we accept the Torah on ourselves even more. We do extra tfilot, we daven and we sing to Hashem, Shirot Vesishpachot, and Gemilot Chasadim. We give Matanot Le'avyonim, gifts to the poor, Mishloach Manos. That's Purim. I just got an answer, by the way. Very simple. I, I'm, I'm almost. I'm almost tempted to respond, but I'm not going to play it over here in case she ever sees one day. Uh, it's not going to be good. Anyhow, uh, my friends, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Everything you do, a little more upgrade. This makes you closer to Hashem. It allows you to find a better shidduch. It gives you tools. And Bezat Hashem, when they look at us, they won't say, oh, wow. There's ego there. There's non-caring there. But instead, you're going to say, wow, this person, I thought they davened, but look how careful they are for minyan. I thought they learned, but look, at, they're making a siyum. They're finishing. They're always listening to some sort of Torah in the car. Instead of rock music, they're listening to Torah. At Gemilut Chasadim, they have the betterment of everyone. That's somebody I want to marry. That's somebody I want to connect with. 
That's the upgrade I'm looking for in my life. And let me reiterate at the end. Very easy. Go to dailygiving.org. Again, I get nothing. From, they actually give Shabbat.com, but that's, you know, a dollar or two is not going to make a difference. But I think it's a beautiful thing. And I want to tell you today, there's over 9,000 people who give a dollar a day, which means that these tzedakahs get over $9,000 every day. Could you imagine how many people you could feed in Tom Chai Shabbos? Shabbat.com, which is my organization, also gets from daily giving. And Bezrat Hashem, tomorrow, the new site is launching. It took us two and a half years. The brand new site with Shaduchim and Shabbos invitations. Bezrat Hashem, we've worked on it very hard. Thank you. The Chesed of Hashem. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to change so many lives. Bezrat Hashem, I give you each a bracha. You should find that Shaduch. You should upgrade your lives. You cannot lose. You could only gain. Wish you a Purim Sameach Mavarach.